Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session of today in TechCon 2023. I'm Brian Wilson. I'm your virtual host for the track today. And uh, we're here to keep the conversation going. So please don't be shy. Ask questions, make comments in the, in the chat window. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dan to get our session going. Hi, I'm Dan Temkin, uh, API Connect Product Management, and, and I'm here with Alan Chad, a product manager from our event uh, side as well. And we're here really to talk about Beyond REST. You know, are you really ready for multi-form API management uh, going beyond just you know, the, the, the basics? Uh, hopefully, you were able to attend the, the earlier morning session around uh, trends and directions with API management and gateways. So you may have already gotten a bit of a taste of this. This is where we'll dive in a little deeper. So. APIs are, are really the key enabler to digital transformation today. We expect information to be accessible to us, whether it be from inside our own business or from different uh, data sources that we want access to. And it's the shape of the data that's concerning. How can we easily take different data sources, pull them together, aggregate them, uh, and not just by pulling them, uh, going and getting them, but also by having information pushed to us as well, being able to interact with it in different methods. So it's, it's no surprise that as the, the amount of data is growing, the amount of data we want to be able to access and consume is growing, that more organizations are building additional APIs, uh, building different methods and um, models for accessing data. And the complexity of how data is being uh, integrated is, is growing. Now, now with that, at you know, the end of the day, Regardless of how we're exposing our data, regardless of what methods are being used to access it, if it's a mobile application, if it's a web application, if it's service-to-service -service integration, we're trying to unlock a business value through the use of APIs. Again, APIs don't just have to be our REST JSON. It can be far more than that. But it's unlocking and tapping into those business assets to discover new value or, or re-leverage the value that we've already put into those to, for the benefit of our end user. Uh, whether, our, again, our end user be someone at the end of a, a mobile application or even at the end of a green screen terminal. So when we look at it, APIs are taking on, let's see, there we go. APIs are taking on more shapes and sizes. So, you know, when it comes to solving different technical challenges, different interaction patterns, we're definitely seeing that we need more than one tool or a toolbox. Not everything is a good fit for REST JSON. Not everything is a good fit for GraphQL or Kafka or WebSockets. Or yes, still we have those, those SOAP services still out there. So now we really want to look at how can we take all the lessons learned and apply them forward as, as we look at uh, API management. Well, I'm getting the, uh, the slide not moving forward. And sometimes, Alan, you might be able to. Okay, there, there we go. It is. Oh, oh. Are we going to go just to the screen share? All right. Give me. I will. Uh, I'll just go to screen share mode. Give me one moment here. Then, I, I turn that off. All right. So, API management. You know, really, when we look at it, it's about taking those systems of engagement applications. However, we want to consume our data and leverage our data, and figuring out how can we best. Uh, access those backend services in a managed model. Um, doesn't matter what format we're going into. Now, of course, different formats have come to the surface as industry standards, such as the you know, what used to be known as Swagger, now known as Open API Specification. But this is nothing new. We've gone through this process of adopting industry standards for dealing with commu decoupled communication between systems in the past. Uh, we yeah, for those of you who you know, remember, like myself, we went through the service oriented architecture days where you know the the WSDL was and SOAP was the all powerful solution for providing system to system integration. But when we look at this continuum of what are we looking at providing, we need to be able to start with you know, designing and planning for what are we looking at exposing from a technical and business asset. How can we create it? Whether it be a top down or bottom up model, it's still creating that contract definition that we need to to be able to share. Moving it into from a test and publication standpoint so that we, as a provider, we know the quality and consistency of what we're going to be delivering to our consumers. Of course, making sure that it's uh, meeting all of our security requirements so we don't have uh, both, you know, so the access controls are properly implemented so that there's no uh, data leakage that, that might be implied, that there's, you know, anything that's sensitive is redacted out. 
And then eventually I need to be able to manage all these, these assets that I'm putting out there uh, and you know, provide them out so that consumers can start looking at how can I discover them? How can I uh, see the additional metadata that's about these services to leverage the asset? You know, get that, that unique experience of, I, I don't necessarily initially care about what the format of the structure is. I want to know what's the business data that I'm trying to consume. Is it available to me, uh, for me to consume? And of course, starting to consume those services. So that way I can leverage those, whether it be an API or Kafka topic or SOAP interface uh, as we go. And then of course, both from the consumer standpoint and the provider standpoint, provide monitoring and analytics. So that way we can understand what's going on when I am using that service and then start feeding that back in uh, to the, the continuum of the life cycle. Now we've seen you know, time and time again, you know, without strong API management, you know, there are challenges that that are uh, you know that keep happening. You know, one of it is uh, that idea of API sprawl. I have all these different endpoints, and I just don't know where they are all in my organization. I'm spending lots of time either trying to find the endpoint or giving up and just creating another endpoint that provides a similar same data uh, access that someone already created. So that's an inefficiency uh, in the organization, as well as creating a lot of additional technical debt and additional cost. Um, then we also have things like the ad hoc and inconsistent experience. Uh, what happens when I want to version those APIs? If I'm doing it without a management solution, I might have to uh, formulate a very strict organizational and people and process model, but then I have to decide, all right, my .NET developers, my Java developers, uh, my third-party application developers, how are they all going to implement that people and process model without some underlying technology to help them? So really, that's where API management can realize the goals of an API management organization uh, in, in providing those functionality. And of course, you know, providing secure, you know, uh, dealing with things like security vulnerability. How can we make sure that we have consistency of security enforcement, whether it be authentication, authorization, protocol, determination, all in a unified fashion? So that way I don't have to, you know, always go, oh, that front door is that Java application or is that .NET application or again, that third party app that I don't really know how it's built behind the scenes. I want to make sure that I provide a, a strong front door from day one. So again, we've been doing this for quite some time with REST and SOAP. This is nothing new. Uh, we've been taking those REST APIs, you know, Swagger, the Open API Spec 2, Open API Spec 3, and taking those contracts and, and providing a full API management model. And of course, bringing along those SOAP services as well. And you know, when we look at it, you know, they both provide kind of a, a different view of the world. REST is really great at that uh, resource-based model. I'm going and going for one, you know, that ID of N or, you know, ID of one for, you know, customer, you know, one, and I want to get their information back. And then I want to go get customer information for ID of two, three, four, and so on and so forth. It's really good at, at those individual resource requests. Now, we have managed to take REST and, and morph it into, you know, to fit the business need. But you know, really, it was geared at that individual resource model. And of course, SOAP was a, a bring up from the, the, the big business contracts uh, of, of RPC days. But when we look at it you know, from SOAP or REST, we still have a common API management point that across all of our different integration use cases, whether it be uh, dealing with you know, APIs from a business app, API-led integration with things like App Connect Designer, uh, dealing with event-led integration, messaging. It's how do I provide access controls? How do I do this in a unified, uniform way, you know, that authentication and authorization? How do I look at managing the workloads, being able to expose the workloads, but then provide different types of rate limiting and SLA uh, you know, availability metrics as, with, in it, as well as provide isolation between all those different services? How can I provide a delightful user experience to my developers by making it easy for them to discover the APIs and services that are out there in my organization, as well as provide those self-service functionality to allow them to register for their services, test out those services without writing any code, and then accelerate their coding process uh, by giving them samples. And then, of course, now that I have a managed state, I can start looking at making sure that I don't have duplication of, of APIs, or if I do have duplication, they're done with specific business purpose. Uh, that they're they're uh, providing a unique asset for the organization. And I can do that by partially socializing all the assets that I have, uh, tagging and categorizing those assets and looking across and making sure that I'm doing reuse properly. And of course, Per, you know, stopping breaking changes. Uh, I want to make sure that I've decoupled my service provider from my service consumer. You know, it's a, a big part of 
of you know an API management and a gateway layer is to make sure that I can make changes at the provider I, uh, without necessarily impacting the service consumer because that contract that I'm hosting at the gateway is acting as a service facade. And I can make you know mapping changes, I can make validation changes there, and I can do rerouting uh, at the gateway to new backend endpoints without the service consumer nece necessarily knowing. And I can provide multiple versions of that service facade up um, on, the, on the, uh, the API management platform and let the service consumer decide when it's appropriate for them to make the change, of course, within the rolling window of your organization. Now, the, uh, you know, for those of you who you know, can't recognize, this is the, the journey of, of Captain Cook uh, as, as he went around the world. And you know, there, there were times where, you know, okay, we, we you know, go, go north for a while. And then, oh, that, that really wasn't the way we wanted to go. So, you know, shifted south and, you know, did some did some loop-to-loops. It's a journey. It's going and exploring what are the, the different processes uh, and, and approaches that are successful, as well as some ways that maybe have, have you know, taken us on, on a bit of a, a journey of exploration. Why we wanted to put this out there is that first time going through the process, you're going to go left, you're going to go right, you're going to circle the island a few times. But as we're able to take those lessons learned and apply them again and again to new technologies coming forward, we can leverage all the insight that we've, we've built up over the years. So as we look at new technologies, uh, whether it be infrastructure technologies like deploying an API management solution on Kates or OpenShift, or looking at providing uh, API policy enforcement for things like GraphQL or Apache Kafka, we can take all the lessons learned of our first few journeys uh, and apply them uh, you know, as, as we go around the world. So when we talk about API management, again, not talking about APIs in the form of just REST APIs, but talking about them in the grander form of APIs in, in all the different formats. We want to make sure that we have different facets that provide the functionality of a, a solution. Uh, it's not just the API implementation. That's, you know, that, that's where the business logic is. That's where the core, the complexities are going to be from a business standpoint. But all those different technical aspects, those uh, non-functional and functional aspects that are common across all my APIs let me, you know, the, of the API implementation, let me move them up to that gateway. So you know, items like decoupling and routing. Items like traffic management and security, or you know, and when necessary, data translation and transformation can be leveraged at the gateway. So that way, again, we provide that nice decoupling between the implementation uh, of the backend and our service consumers. But we want it to be, again, from an IBM standpoint, it needs to be a fully integrated solution. So we just can't have a gateway there. We need to look at how can I make the provider experience a great uh, experience about being able to take the API contracts that I'm already building in my, you know, let's just say Node.js or Java application, and I'm exporting those out. So bottom-up kind of development from, from our perspective, or maybe I'm using API Connect to just start describing my open API specification contracts and doing a top-down model where then I'm handing that off to um, my development team to start building the implementation of that API contract. I can leverage the manager for that whole process, determine you know, things like access controls of, am I allowed as a provider to publish out to the gateway or do I have to stage it and get approval uh, from a team lead? So providing a full lifecycle controls as part of that, as well as you know, policy administration. So I might have specific security policies that my enterprise wants or logging policies that need to be enforced. Uh, that I, as a, and as a single API provider, should not necessarily be able to decide, nope, I don't want that one or I do want that one. So providing that policy administration, both at policies that I can choose as an implementer, as well as that my organization has chosen for me. And lastly, getting insight into, I've published maybe 10, 20 different APIs out there. Which ones are being used? Who's subscribing to what APIs? What API, at, you know, if I've created multiple plans, kind of that silver, uh, bronze, gold kind of plans of, of different rate limits, who's subscribing to which plans and why? Trying to derive insight out of that. So from a, a provider standpoint, looking for that, that really delightful experience. And then as I click publish, having it published both to the gateway as well as to the developer portal. So that way users of my developer portal can uh, see, you know, find, find my APIs, uh, search based on the, the API names, the data inside the contracts, additional tags and metadata, uh, classifications that group like APIs together so I can see, you know, see them based on hierarchical tree structures. And provide all that self-service support of can I onboard myself to your API platform? As well as can I self-service 
uh, onboard to individual API subscriptions, managing my own API keys and secrets. Uh, so that way, when I need to rotate them, I'm in control as a consumer of, of the platform. And of course, dealing with account usage and analytics, seeing the, the analytics from my perspective, so I can understand how my users of my application, you know, let's say that mobile application is using them. So again, this has been a very common theme as across all of API management for quite some time. So when we look at extending out the API management model into GraphQL, Kafka, and, and you know, of course, WebSockets, it's, it just seems you know, like, all right, let's take all those wonderful lessons learned that we've had and apply them, but not just say, all right, we're going to treat all of these service types as REST APIs, because they're not. They're unique in their own and interesting ways uh, where we want to have uh, a bespoke solution that still follows the whole API management paradigm that still follows, that leverages the, the, you know, the API gateway model, that leverages a unified manager and developer portal that can support these different types of APIs and give the consumer uh, the best experience possible. So I'm gonna start in and, and, and dig a little more into GraphQL. Now, API management for GraphQL is something uh, uh, IBM API Connect actually added almost, uh, or a little over two years ago now as part of our original version 10 release. But with the uh, announcements of our acquisition of Steps in, we, we decided to spend some extra time today uh, kind of going back over you know, wh where we see uh, GraphQL really fitting in the API management model and, and some of its, its common use cases. So again, you know, the, you know, some of the big issues we see with you know, looking at, um, you know, those, especially REST APIs, is I want more than just the data provided at me at the one endpoint. I need, as part of my mobile application, maybe I need the customer information, I need the account information. If, let's say, I'm dealing with a, you know, a, a, a shopping cart, I might need what's, you know, what's in the cart. And I want to be able to collect all that information from multiple services without putting all the burden on my application, you know, my mobile app, to make all these little calls and aggregate all that data together and kind of try to shape the data in one place. So again, when we talk about providing that delightful consumer experience, it's really about you know, taking the data of, of, of services and, and again, as the slide says, moving it into the world of experiences, bringing it in into a, a, a way that we can uh, display information uh, to, dr to drive things like backend for front ends, uh, that we can leverage you know, more of those you know, experience driven APIs. So I see this you know, as, as really part of a continuum. You know, when, again, we had our, our REST you know, eight, uh, APIs really, really good at focus on, I want to get the customer information. I want to get the order information. I want to get the shipping information. It's really good at providing that uh, tight granularity. But suddenly when we start saying, oh, I want to get all the customers and I want to start doing things like pagination and I want to start doing things like, uh, you know, complex filtering, suddenly we're, we're taking what was a very clean and elegant model of, of what REST was, and we start trying to augment it with, okay, we'll, we'll create a pattern for implementation of pagination, and we'll have to figure out what layer is going to support that. We're going to describe how we want to do filtering, but it's not necessarily going to be the same for every single API implementation because that's a design decision that often uh, API practitioners make. And you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that's codified in the, the open API specification. So then if we flip to the other side and, and go all the way to the SQL side, you know, SQL is really good at doing some of those, oh, I want to get a uh, high defined uh, definition of query. I want to understand the relationship of data, but now I'm manipulating and working directly on the data source. And, and we, no, no, we want to have that nice abstraction uh, between our, our data source itself and our consumer experience. So we can look at GraphQL as taking the best of SQL, being able to look at different data sources and join them together, filter on it using a, a common syntax that's well understood and well defined as well as providing our JSON structure models that we, we, we like using with REST that easily enables our mobile applications and web applications uh, you know, to build out uh, services as well as our service-to-service -service integration and bring that together from an easy consumption model into GraphQL, where I can suddenly start describing things like, I wanna get the customer information of my, my John uh, customer, but I also wanna see the, the order information that's associated with that customer. So again, doing those joins, doing that uh, distinct filtering. And again, we'll be doing a lot more on GraphQL as it relates to both API management and, uh, and, and Sepsen in a later session today with uh, myself and, and Morris. 
Now, the, the next part of, of, of really when we look at the power of GraphQL is not just again taking information from one source, but setting up multiple GraphQL services where I can start saying, I have a customer or an order or a delivery subgraph, and I'm going to pull those together as one uh, you know, you know, single graph interface where I'm federating that data together. And then maybe the, those customer graphs is actually, again, a collection of subgraphs themselves. And I can start pulling all this information together into a unified insight. But I, instead of it being where the consumer is suddenly going, oh, I'm getting you know, hundreds upon hundreds of records, I'm getting thousands of fields that I might not be interested in. They get to choose at runtime what fields they're interested in, the shape of their data. So giving them that, that really uh, you know, bespoke and unique interface. Uh, and that allows, again, that, that clean decoupling between, now I am a provider providing the ability to access my data as a GraphQL service, and the consumer going, well, I, I like the access to your data, but this is the shape I want it in. And instead of as in a REST API model where we have to define those, or I'm going to have a one facade that's for my mobile development team because they want it really tight. And then I'm going to have a different facade for my, uh, you know, my B2B services because they need all the data. They don't want to be making lots of calls back and forth. And I have to maintain those different contracts of those different formats of data. Now I can say, I have a GraphQL API that has access to all the data, assuming you have security access, as well as you as the consumer gets to define the shape of that, that information that you're trying to access. So we can imagine we can take all of those facets of API management that we talked before and apply them where the API implementation is now a GraphQL service. And I can start looking at how do I do traffic management on a GraphQL service? And we'll, we'll get more of that on, on the call with Morris, but as, as a quick hint, when I make a single call, again, with that super graph model, I might be querying lots of data sources. So having a rate limit of 100 transactions per second might be not meaningful anymore. So actually being able to interpret the GraphQL service, what does that service actually mean from a gateway perspective and have understanding of what's being done at the service layer instead of it just being at the HTTP layer uh, gives us a more meaningful experience of what's being able to deliver from, again, as, as one example, traffic management and providing that full end-to-end -end experience uh, for, for the API consumer and the API provider when it comes to GraphQL. So does that mean every time I use GraphQL, I got to put it behind an API management layer? Well, no, probably not. So this is just like I have uh, existing APIs today. I might have existing, uh, you know, someone will be talking about Kafka topics. I might have existing uh, you know, SOAP services that aren't necessarily put under a management layer. It's all about providing that additional business value and justification and reason for, for having that IT and business investment in uh, providing those services up. So there are definite cases where it's going to make perfect sense to have it behind a management layer. If I'm creating an enterprise-wide GraphQL service where I want everybody in my organization to be able to access this and, and leverage the data, but now I want to be able to put specific security controls on it. I want to put different rate limits based on who you are as a consumer. I want to have different types of routing controls uh, based on what's leveraged. Or again, if I'm opening up a long-lived WebSocket connection for, for that gold tier, I might let them leave those connections open uh, indefinitely, and I might allow them to have up to 100 connections where maybe for that, that silver tier, bronze tier, I'm only going to let them to have that connection open for a shorter period of time and maybe only for their application, uh, 10 connections open concurrently at a time. And if they want more, well, now let's talk about the value stream of moving to a gold plan. So again, providing a lot of those same API management functionalities over, uh, over, over to the new systems. I might be exposing this GraphQL service to outside entities outside of my organization, again, another one of those where it's uh, quite meaningful for an API management solution. And then when we get into those systems of record APIs, and usually those are probably gonna be either being, uh, you know, GraphQLs that are being pulled into additional graphs. So, you know, again, that, that subgraph model. So there, maybe they're pulled in, maybe they're not, uh, you know, being leveraged. But for the most part, if I'm making a call from one graph service to another graph service, do I really, you know, especially if they're owned by the same line of business or business organization, I might not need to put an API management layer there. And then you know, the, the one that comes up a lot is you know, backend for front-end APIs. If I'm the UX owner and I'm building that backend for front-end GraphQL service, 
and I'm you know, hosting that data store API, it's all inside my own application boundary. So unless I'm starting to look at sharing that API out, where maybe it's becoming that external API or an enterprise API, you know, it moves its classification, then there's a good chance I can, I can build that service as a, as a standalone and don't necessarily need to manage it. So again, looking at management of APIs um, from a GraphQL perspective is just like when we look at management of APIs from a REST or a SOAP perspective. It's about putting and aligning the correct business value to adding in the additional topologies and infrastructures and organizational controls that we, we want to have onto it. So with that, um, we're going we're gonna to pivot over and talk about API management for events uh, with Alan. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. So the great, um, uh, the great news about what Dan's talked us through in terms of like the, the way that we apply uh, kind of API management and the API lifecycle across, you know, the, everything that we've learned from, from REST and what we've done with SOAP out to graph is that it also extends to events. And this is what we're seeing, as Dan mentioned at the front, like it's about that picking the right set of interfaces for the kind of interaction that you want, uh, that you want to support here. So I think it's useful to like, in the same way that we dwelled on, like where does, where does graph uh, fit in? Like is, why events? Like, what's driving this interest in, in event-based interaction patterns, and, and where do they fit? And so, I start with thinking about, like, well, uh, actually, it's it's not driven by a kind of infrastructure team thinking, "Hey, this is a nice interface uh, to present." It's driven by the sets of use cases that people are trying to build and trying to implement, and. All, like these are just some example use cases that we picked up from various conversations, specifically around retail, because we think they'll like uh, resonate uh, with a lot of people. But honestly, like we're finding these kinds of uh, like, like event-driven use cases are very pervasive in terms of like uh, across every industry in terms of what people are heading towards. And what really uh, to us re resonates is that all of the, um, the plethora of event-driven use cases that people want to start using these event-based interactions for, they boil down to like basically repurposing, reusing a set of really core events that relates to what is going on in your business. So it might be around stock movements or orders that are being placed or, you know, people like customers using loyalty apps or in-store transactions. But it's a, it's a core set of events that people will want to reuse and repurpose in a lot of different ways. And so like to us, in order to really facilitate this, it screams we need to take everything that we've learned around API management, like creating like reusable interfaces that, that can be kind of repurposed for, for, repurposed for new projects and, uh, and make that interface available more broadly and apply it to events. Now, it's worth uh, kind of like uh, thinking about like, well, okay, so how do events and, and kind of APIs complement each other? Like, most people are very familiar with the, those like rest based in interfaces so like where does events fit fit into that if if that's my kind of background is is rest based interfaces so i i wish i could claim credit for this piece of uh, insight but actually it came from other others in the team but i think it really nicely summarizes the relationship between these apis are really great for exposing an interface when a user wants to interact with with you. So the kinds of interactions that a user is going to come to you for um, might be things like, you know, uh, uh, placing an order or, or looking something up like where is what, where is my delivery? Where is the truck driver? Those kinds of questions. But basically, the user is interacting with you. If you're thinking about an interaction that you want to drive with the user, then broadly speaking, these kinds of interactions tend to fit a more event-driven pattern. So this is like your order has been delivered. It, you know, where has it been delivered? Uh, a transfer has happened. Your parcel has been shipped. Like as things happen, it's, it's something you know and you know you want to drive that interaction with the user. So this is where kind of event, uh, event type interfaces fit in. And the increased interest in sharing events and reusing events comes from like the just the explosion of use cases we see that kind of fit that model where we want to proactively engage with with people or proactively drive something um, with, within our business. Unpacking that 
one layer deeper. I, I, I like this diagram because it shows, uh, it goes that one layer deeper and it also kind of acknowledges an, an overlap where actually there's this like synergy between maybe what we've been doing with, with APIs and where events kind of starts to fit in. Because as with any tools, like there, there, is, a, um, there is a crossover where actually like there are alternative uh, approaches to solving the, uh, the, same, the same challenge. So we would already talked about like the kinds of interactions where a user wants something to happen, like an order being placed or make a transfer or, you know, create an account record, things like that. That's what we're very used to with like REST based interfaces. So you make a request to, uh, to, to a back end system, it acts on it, and maybe you get an acknowledgement back. Second kind of interaction that you might have is around requesting states, like what is my account balance? Where is my order? Like what is the uh, phone number for a particular uh, customer record in my CRM system? So where you want to know something, you know, get an answer back. Uh, again, we're, we're probably quite used to having a, a REST interface uh, for that. As Dan was describing, it's like REST is particularly optimized where you're making kind of queries about like a a single entity um, where you you make your your request, you are you you tell it like specific specifically what you want it about, and you're expecting a response back, like the answer to your request. This is where we start to see there's a like the, there's another approach that we can take around events that is suited for certain situations, not all, but but certain situations where we want to kind of instead of waiting for someone to request. Uh, the state, uh, like make a request, is we want to proactively push every change, uh, every change that happens out, so that an application, rather than making a request, it can just subscribe to all of those change events. So every time something changes, we publish an event. Something has changed. What has changed? An application can subscribe to those changes, and it can effectively kind of replay those and build itself its own local copy of. Uh, the information that it's interested in. Sometimes this is known as like a, a projection, a view on, onto the data, and it's kept local to the application. And every time the, um, the original data changes, that change is published out and is applied to this local cache. So it's not transactionally up to date, it is definitely eventually consistent. But this model um, is particularly useful in a couple of situations. One is where your application needs really low latency access uh, to the events. Um, it can have them held in a local data store, very local to where that application is, is running. Or if it needs like very, very high frequency um, uh, kind of queries or queries that run over huge amounts of the data or disparate data. Again, like this can be a useful, useful pattern. So we're seeing this emerge as like, as a complementary pattern to like present like surfacing data with, with an API. In addition to that, there's also what I've described here at the bottom, which is notification, which is very, very suited for the way that events work. Basically something happens, an event is published and applications can come along, subscribe to those events and they will get pushed. They will get sent a notification as soon as that thing happens that they're, that they're interested in. And this is very like useful for situations where, like, if you think of an omni-channel ex uh, experience, where, uh, as has happened to me recently, you place, uh, you make a kind of airline reservation through through their their website, and almost instantly, the frequent like frequent flyer app that I have on my phone is is kind of notifying me, just confirming that the reservation has been made. It it can tell me like which, which seats I've been allocated. I can you know then choose to change those seats uh, there and then. And it's, it's just kind of like keeping me up to date with the flight. And that kind of instant omni-channel experience where like I book through one channel and instantly I can interact with it like uh, and being notified about it through another, again, is very much like uh, centered around that notification uh, pattern. So hopefully you can see like how APIs and events kind of complement each other and how there's this um, how there's this uh, oh, like kind of overlap where actually both approaches might make sense depending on how the application wants wants to consume it, and then the same kind of uh, just like reiterating the same thought process that uh, that we've been through that Dan Dan described about like how these are just another interface 
to a system that supports another set of interaction patterns. So in the same way uh, that Dan describes us uh, wanting to help people manage and lifecycle kind of graph, uh, graph interfaces, the same equally applies to events. Now it's an asynchronous interface, it's, it's a kind of like pub sub interaction pattern, but the same management concerns like still apply here. And one last point that I'll make, especially around kind of uh, the, this requesting state, is where there's two approaches where actually which one is better um, really depends on how the application uh, that's going to use it uh, needs to needs to work or what it wants to do. In many cases, what we're working like what we're working with people around is presenting both both an API and um, an event based interface to a system, such that you like by having both. Um, your your application consumer can decide the best way to interact or request the information that uh, that they want, the best interface for them. So, as I was saying, why do we want to manage like if, event interfaces? Because the exact same questions around like reusing events um, uh, uh, that we've already kind of asked and answered around like REST APIs, they equally apply here. So how do I control access? Like I don't, maybe certain streams of events, I don't want everyone to access, or maybe I want to have a manual approval process because um, the events relate to uh, like particular customers in particular geographies. How do I like actually manage the workload um, events, like prevent, um, prevent backends from getting overwhelmed, like provide I uh, isolation there between consumers. Um, how do I have that kind of isolation point so that I can decouple my uh, backend implementation from the interface that I'm, I'm uh, presenting? How do I socialize it? How do I even make people aware that this is available for them to reuse? Like all of these questions um, that we've already you know, asked ourselves and answered around APIs apply to events. And as the, the map of uh, um, Captain Cook's kind of voyage, like we don't have to invent these answers afresh for, for events. Um, we, we're going to kind of shortcut that journey because we've already kind of been and explored, explored a, a lot of these. We just need to apply it to another interface. So how have we done that around uh, for events? Uh, and the very the way to think about this is we're literally taking API management principles and, uh, and applying them, uh, applying them to events. What I want to go through is uh, how they apply because some, some principles apply directly, some of them have analogies and some ne don't necessarily fit uh, exactly. Some, some things are uh, event specific. So I want to really focus on kind of what are those like analogies and differences? Like how, how does your understanding of the way that you work with like REST and those interfaces help translate into this, uh, into this events and asynchronous space? So let's start off with how we actually describe uh, these these interfaces. I hope by now, like everyone is very familiar with with Open API. I'm like very sure that you are. Um, now there is a sister, uh, what I think of as a sister project to Open API uh, called Async API. It's a really in, uh, really interesting project. Its goal is around like describing these asynchronous uh, asynchronous systems. The good news is, um, I think it was conceived precisely as a sister project to Open API because there are, if, for anyone familiar with Open API, Async API shares very similar concepts in the way that it's structured and the, and the way that it works. It's a great interface because it goes beyond just describing like the the actual kind of content of the event. It uh, supports all of the metadata around like what the event, uh, what the event source is, like who owns it, um, all of this kind of interface information. The reason I think it's a, it needs to be a separate project from Open API is because the, the asynchronous space has, uh, I would say, more diversity, certainly in terms of protocols that are relevant in this space. I think around like REST APIs, we've obviously like pretty much standardized on, on HTTP and kind of like uh, web technologies is the underpinning for, for what we do around synchronous APIs. But asynchronous APIs, we have Kafka, we have AMQP, we have MQ, we have MQTT, like we have all sorts of, of ways. Um, and all of these protocols have their own uh, kind of ways of behaving. So async API contain, uh, like has extensions and bindings that support all of these different kinds of, kinds of interfaces. So this is, um, but 
as as a standard, uh, this is you can think of this as as basically an equivalent of of Open API, and this is what we embrace here for describing these asynchronous interfaces. In terms of making things dis uh, discoverable, um, again, there's nothing new we need to invent here. Uh, we have the concept of a developer catalog, and this is exactly what we need for events. It needs to be searchable. It needs to present these interfaces in a human-readable way that uh, consumers can come along, discover, and you know, self self sign up. I think the key thing to highlight about our approach here is that we are like this isn't a separate portal for uh, that you have to use for. It for events from your, your APIs. It can be the same portal. And this becomes really interesting and important in those situations where actually you want to present like different interfaces uh, to the same backend system because you want um, to present a range of tools, a range of, a range of interaction patterns that your kind of consuming application can choose which one is right for them, the way that they need to interact or the kind of interaction that they want to support. And I think this is going to become like really, really important to have this like single portal across different interface types as like as we go on this journey and add more interaction patterns here. Now, part of enabling that self-service is to then put in place the guardrails that you need in order to uh, in order to support this. Um, what we are doing in this, uh, this, I guess, requires two things. One is. Um, uh, the ability to specify them. And the second is the ability to enforce them. Now, in order to specify them, um, we are like, again, it's a single management approach that, that we want to take here. Now, not all of the policies are, like, are directly applicable. And because we have only been like managing events for like uh, 12 to 18 months, we're not at the same degree of sophistication as we are able to control around like rest endpoints but that this is something that isn't going to take us like a decade and a half to mature this is something we're going to get there in like easily half like uh, twice as quick as we uh, as we have done for apis but like the way that you uh, specify them is is part of like what you're defining as you go forward and and, and socialize them and, and it's that same principle that we're uh, that we're doing um, conversely you need somewhere to uh, enforce them uh, and that's uh, that's something that needs to understand the protocol and needs to be able to understand it sufficiently to be able to enact those uh, those those policies so this is something uh, oh and also like keep track track of who is able to access which events such that you can then use that revoke individual access or or you can just track who is using which interface as part of that kind of life cycle management of, of these interfaces and then finally, um, I, I think about decoupling. This is like more ex, uh, kind of building on like that the enforcement and lifecycle points, which is um, decoupling or using that enforcement point, that gateway component as uh, you know, a, a point of decoupling. So it's it separates your kind of back end like implementation that's actually producing the events from the consumers so that you can evolve your your implementation uh, within your application domain kind of independently whilst maintaining that same that same interface um, but it also gives you a point that you can actually like uh, perform that versioning kind of you know create that version version two and and kind of work on moving people over from a version one to a version two uh, for, form of interface um, the other decoupling that that makes sense in an event uh, event space is decoupling between consumers so you don't want different consumers who don't know about each other to accidentally interfere with the consumption of uh, events um, and consume each other's events or, or or anything like that so again like that enforcement point is part of that form of decoupling like keeping keeping these groups of people uh, separate just a, a quick kind of side note and, and advertising there is a deeper dive session that we are running I think it's uh, I think it's probably tomorrow. Uh, I don't know for sure, but have a look in your agenda and check it out. It's a deeper dive from uh, Salma and Dale where they'll actually like demo uh, demo this capability in 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 action. So you get get a real sense of, of kind of how it works. This is going in deeper as to like the async API spec itself and um, and how this manifests it, itself in in IBM's portfolio. 
But to give you a, um, a kind of like an indication of how this translates from your understanding of, of the way that APIs are managed, like this is the diagram that, that, that uh, or a variant of the diagram that Dan was using before to explain kind of like how, uh, where the, the main components of API management and how they come together to like to manage APIs. So you have your portal, your manager component, and you have your kind of runtime enforcement in the form of an API gateway. So it's the exact same pattern that we're taking with uh, like managing asynchronous interfaces with, with managing events. The key difference is in that runtime enforcement. So the developer portal is doing the same job. It's you know discovery, self-service, um, uh, these kind of things. The manager component is doing the same job. It's the place where you define what you want to uh, externalize, where you specify any policies. It's where you can view, kind of, like, take things through a life cycle and, and view who is using it. So like, there's nothing new to invent there and we haven't invented anything new there, I think is, is the key point. Where we have invented something new is, is in the enforcement point. The bit that understands um, the the asynchronous protocol and where we've started today is with the uh is with the the kafka protocol so our event gateway um transparently understands and intercepts the kafka protocol and it understands it enough like for anyone that's looked at, at the kafka protocol will understand that it it's not just a simple kind of like request reply uh there is a, many more uh, many more aspects and nuances to the flow. Like there's a, a bootstrap negotiation around where, how your application is able to um, kind of know where to connect to uh, based on what topic it's consuming from and, and things like that. So this, these are all the elements of the protocol that the event gateway has to like be able to intercept, interpret and appropriately kind of augment in order to ensure that um, your, your kind of connection to the, the events that your consumers want to subscribe to can be protected, can have all of those uh, uh, po like uh, any policy in enforced on it and access controlled and, and things like that. The other, um, just kind of like building on the differences, there is another really kind of key difference uh, between asynchronous and synchronous interfaces. And this really comes from um, like, I think this extra layer of decoupling that exists in an asynchronous world. It's the fact that um, the, the kind of events are delivered via a, a brokered mechanism. So you have this kind of like, extra component in here that's responsible for um, for actually kind of routing, uh, doing the uh, routing of events. So your, your backend implementation isn't kind of publishing the events directly to a gateway, it's publishing to some kind of uh, broker technology such as uh, Kafka. And it's like the events are being kind of surfaced from that or shared from that kind of broker technology. And so this introduces um, uh, something that's something interesting uh, and, and an extra kind of nuance that that we don't really think about in an API world because um, like connectivity around APIs, like the routing for that is all taken care of like at the network layer. Like we literally don't give it a second second thought. And so like there is no kind of problem or, or, or anything you need to think about when you are kind of uh, in like an application is running in the cloud, but it's invoking an API that's implemented in a, like an on-premise data center. Like that, that routing is taken care of at the network layer. But for events, um, this like the actual kind of routing of events uh, that you can do is is typically taken care of by the uh, the broker technology. So you, you have to be slightly more conscious of kind of where you're like routing uh, and how you're routing those events. So. I, uh, what I mean by that is it's entirely possible um, to like consume events like between locations uh, directly. So you can, uh, if you imagine that the bottom part of this diagram here, where we have our events like uh, it being emitted from an application published to a Kafka cluster that's maybe in your kind of on-premise data center, you can run like consuming applications in the uh, in the cloud that subscribe to them directly. Uh, that's that's entirely possible. Maybe your consuming applications actually want to kind of buffer the events like locally, such that they're consuming from a kind of local buffered uh, local buffered copy. Again, this is entirely possible. You just like take those events, subscribe to them, 
consume them into your like local cluster, and then your application, like consuming application, can uh, consume them locally. So this is very uh, very straightforward in terms of like how we can consume events. The nuance comes to like where you might want to, where you might have let's say kind of five or six applications all running in your in your cloud environment, maybe all consuming the same stream of events, but for different purposes. Like if you were to follow this model, um, you would have like five or six different applications all consuming the same stream of events. You're effectively kind of rep, um, kind of sending the same data, like uh, same event five or six times over the network. And people, uh, depending on the, the like event throughput and event rate, you can become uh, slightly more conscious of kind of ingress, uh, like data movement charges that, that exist. And so there's an additional pattern that uh, that might uh, that might be useful here that you can actually implement, which is where you you kind of uh, basically almost like pre send pre uh, pre replicate events out to specific locations, such that you can have almost like another point of presence more local to applications that you can uh, that events can be consumed from. So there isn't really a direct analogy around uh, between kind of this and and kind of APIs to the best of my knowledge, certainly not that you have to be like uh, this aware of, but it can be really interesting and really useful. And when it comes to asynchronous interfaces, because um, effectively you can kind of send events from on premise to cloud once and then fan it out to the like five, six or, you know, maybe more consumers there. So you're, you're suddenly kind of, uh, Cutting the uh, the data any data movement charges that you that, that this kind of a system might impose on you, so it can become really really quite quite interesting. So, the thought I want to kind of leave you, uh, uh, I guess, leave you with is like, yes, there are like all of the principles that you know and understand and workflow around API management definitely applies to uh, to events, and. Um, and hopefully you can see exactly how that applies. But I guess more interestingly and more importantly, you've understand you've started to understand the, the kind of key differences and key areas where actually uh, events are, are unique and you need to think about like slight, slightly, slightly differently or you know, different things uh, apply. The good news is all of the things that are common, uh, you absolutely can have common, um, and you can do this all in one place with like uh, I, IBM's integration portfolio. You can have a single API manager, a single developer portal advertising these kind of synchronous and, and asynchronous interfaces. And you can have, um, and, and they can control uh, the various uh, gateway technologies that actually can, can enforce uh, uh, enforce the policies that you that you specify that you are using to control uh, control access directly from that single management approach, and this is really really like uh, like beautiful, nice, and efficient when you think about like how that applies to you know coming back to this this life cycle that that Dan was taking us through at the beginning, like because it's this life cycle of how you manage these interfaces. This is like independent of the kinds of uh, whether it's synchronous, asynchronous, whether it's REST, whether it's Graph, whether it's Kafka, whether it's like uh, all of these approaches, like this kind of life cycle of the interface applies. And so it's really nice to be able to have a single like approach, a single um, life cycle uh, approach to all of these different kinds of interfaces. And it's also really nice to have a single place where any any of your kind of developers or consumers can go and they they don't have like separate places for apis for events from graph from like uh, this that and the other they have one place where they see that oh here are all the ways that i can interact with my crm system or with my like uh, back end order order system or what have you and they can pick the right tool the right interface the right interaction pattern depending on what it is that they are uh, trying to achieve so I think that's uh, for us that is really important and some of the unique value that we are looking to bring as part of uh, part of API Connect and, and our broader integration portfolio here. 
So one uh, one kind of final closing thought as, as we get towards the end of this session, um, there's much more to be said. Like I've, I've signposted you to a, like a particular deep dive se session on, on kind of events, but actually, uh, as I think Dan mentioned, there are like going to be like deeper sessions throughout TechCon on all of these different kinds of uh, kinds of interfaces. A couple of things just to like uh, in terms of further reading that, that you might want to kind of refer into to dive into like deeper around here. Uh, gathered together like a couple of key bits of reading around the events, like practitioner guides to how it can be useful, as well as like async API, as well as like just just kind of going through the uh, the thought processes, like uh, why managing like uh, why managing events, and then like Dan, don't know whether you want to say anything about like the API resources that we uh, that we've kind of called out here as well. Yeah, so we, we've included uh, a few of uh, you know setting up setting up. Uh, a little feedback, setting up uh, your API management strategy. So really looking at how do you want to leverage API management, again, as we've mentioned now several times, beyond just a REST model, but across all these different interfaces so that you can figure out what is the right people process and then looking at how can I le you know, leverage my people process and, and the architecture uh, that I want to support for my organization and then adopt the technologies, again, we, we hope from IBM, that can implement the people process and architecture to do so, that then you can start really looking at how can I take these assets and provide that delightful experience for my consumers and providers? How can I enable for new value streams uh, for understanding the business value for these assets that I'm providing? And of course, doing it in a, in a secure and manageable way. All right, thank you guys. Uh, there's one question still in the chat that uh, we haven't answered. Uh, Dan, it's probably for you. Does ACE or API Connect support the Async API standard? So API Connect does support the Async API standard uh, that, that, that we've implemented, the part that we've implemented, which has been for uh, event-based APIs, and that's currently delivered right now through the use of CloudPack for integration. So when you deploy an API uh, management, uh, the, the capability inside of uh, CloudPack for integration, you can enable both, you know, the default is the, the, the uh, REST SOAP APIs, but you can also implement uh, the async APIs as well, which will then deploy out a, uh, the async API, the, the, the Kafka gateway uh, on the cluster as well. And that's currently specifically for, for Kafka-based endpoints. All right, very good. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Alan, for uh, a great session. If um, anyone thinks of other questions that you didn't ask uh, in the primary session here, please come to our office hours, which is at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time today at the end of uh, today's sessions. And, uh, you know, talk to us, tell us what's on your mind, uh, ask that question. And um, don't uh, miss coming up here in two minutes, Mark Randolph. Click on the Cultivating Curiosity session as you refresh uh, and, uh, you know, grab uh, coffee or lunch and uh, sit down, listen to Mark, who's an impressive innovator that uh, is sure to inspire you. So, um, we will see you in a bit. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.